I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Descheiden. And I'm Thomas Mills. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. So before we get into today's topic, as a reminder, Thomas will be lending his skills to perform a virtual home energy audit for a lucky listener. If you haven't entered the prize drawing, you still have another couple of weeks. We've decided to extend the deadline to October 4th when we'll be pulling the lucky winner. So head over to our website, send a quick email just telling us you want to be entered in the context and your first name. Well, we all know that climate change is a massive problem and requires equally massive solutions. And, you know, the reality is sometimes the scale of it can be hard to wrap your head around. You know, whether you're talking about a wildfire that's burned half a million acres or the, you know, roughly 50 gigatons of greenhouse gases that, you know, human activities emit each year. But today we're going to talk about climate solutions on a much smaller scale, the community scale. And while changing government policy is critical and something we all need to be pushing for, it's also important for us all to do our part getting involved in our community. And the beauty is you get to see tangible results firsthand. How about you guys? You've done any uh, community level action when it comes to climate change? Well, uh, not to toot my, no, I I really can't toot my own horn, but I kind of in parallel (laughs) with uh, doing the, the podcast, I've been involved with a, a group that the city of Portland employees, but not f- affiliated with the city of Portland called PEACE, which stands for, uh, it's kind of a long acronym. It stands for Portland Employees Act for the Climate Emergency. And so a bunch of employees from different bureaus have come together. We've created these portfolios. We've come up with these goals that pretty much align themselves with, you know, the climate goals of the United Nations. And we've been, you know, kind of trying to lobby, I guess you would say, leadership within Portland government uh, bureau chiefs and elected officials uh, to, you know, try to get more serious and act more quickly on on climate. Yeah, so that's kind of what I've been spending some some free time on. I didn't know you had free time, but uh... well, I don't. Which there's there's people involved <laughs> in this working a lot harder than me. <laughs> Thomas, what about you? How about all your years of uh, pushing uh, former employees? that we used to work with to, uh, to start cycling to work. I feel like that counts. <laughs> that was probably the most uh, direct climate related uh, sort of community project. But a lot of the things that I, I, I did in the past were um, sort of like the climate was sort of a secondary thing. It was more that it, it, it created like local involvement and engagement and, um, and, the, and the climate benefits just sort of came along with it. Um, like the, the work, with the U.S. Department of Forestry in the Tillamook Range, that, that was you know, really about mountain biking and creating local access for people to the forest. But the the upside of that was well, people end up um, recreating and holidaying locally rather than thinking they've got to get on a jet plane and fly to the other side of the world to do something fun. Um, and so between that and I guess the, my community garden plot, I had a plot in the uh, Colonel Summers Park for about six years there. Um, I guess there are there are a few of those things, but yes, really, p- pushing bikes like their uh, candy was probably my number one thing. <laughs> I, I do like bicycles, and I still do it. <laughs> I don't think I've met somebody who does as good a pressure campaign as you do for bikes, Thomas. So yeah, hats off, Jason. Now that we've we've spilled the beans, just what have you done? Get the hot light out, Thomas. <laughs> Who sent you? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so I think the the biggest contribution, you know, I probably had at the community level was volunteering uh, with an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby. And for those who aren't familiar, they lobby for a price on carbon at a national level. And they do that internationally. They have chapters around the world. And, you know, credit to them, they're certainly a big part of why Canada has a price on carbon right now. Well, with that, uh, Thomas, do you want to uh, take us through this week's reason for hope? 
Sure, Jason. This week's reason for hope is with regard to the uh, last coal-fired power station in Hawaii, which has uh, finally been shut down. So this this uh, shutdown will save about 1.5 metric tons of carbon emissions a year. Um, so roughly the same as taking about 325,000 cars off the road. Um, however, uh, since Hawaii isn't like fully pivoted towards renewables yet, they make about 40% of their uh, electricity from renewable energy at this point in time. But the gap is sort of got to, going to be filled by uh, oil until uh, they get to their 100, 100% renewable target, which at the moment is set at 2045. But I feel a lot of these predictions are linear in fashion, and, and we are going to see a non-linear change, especially as batteries get cheaper, because that's a big problem for a place like Hawaii. It's about storing that energy for when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing. I, 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 I do, do have to note, though, that when you look at the emissions from that last coal-fired power station, um, there are about 10 times the emissions associated with burning jet fuel, flying people back and forth to Hawaii. So... Yeah, you know, we've, we've still got a long way to go with air travel. I, I was excited, though, it, if nothing else, to see the last coal plant come offline as, as a symbol of kind of what's happening all around the U.S. right now, where, where coal plants are being shuttered. Well, pivoting to our main topic, our guest today, Sarah Birch, is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. She's the executive director of the Waterloo Climate Institute. She's also the director of sustainability policy research on urban transformations, what they call their their Sprout Lab, and was a, a lead author of the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and so much more. So amazing resume, and and super excited to to have her to come talk about local impacts and and how community level action is valuable. Sarah, welcome to Climate Optimus. Thanks so much for having me. So let's start you off with a question we do all our guests. When it comes to efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? You know, what might be surprising, I guess, um, to folks who are who are deeply concerned about climate change is that a lot makes me hopeful. <laughs> I can point in, in many different directions. Um, the, the first, I guess, for me is just the level of discourse, the level of conversation that I hear now compared to 10 or 15 years ago, it's just kind of remarkable. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of creativity being brought to the climate change crisis. We are talking more about things that I think are so powerfully important, like the justice dimensions of climate change, like how poverty intersects with climate change. We're putting a human face on it instead of having it be this kind of sanitized technical problem only to do with nature and not to do with us and our politics and our behavior. So those aspects of our of our conversation around climate change make me hopeful that we're kind of stripping away the noise and getting to the heart of the problem. And I also am very, I'm, I'm, I'm ironically also hopeful on the technical side. I'm just seeing these incredible reductions in the cost of renewable energy and other really important technologies that are going to help us along the way. So those kind of add to my energy, I guess, and my my um, sense that there's a lot of solutions out there. Um, and we've had a long time to tinker with those solutions now. So we have evidence uh, of some ones that work and others that don't work so well. So so those are just a couple of the things that at the current moment keep me hopeful. Well, it's good to hear, especially coming from a climate scientist and somebody who's very close to this. And I guess that's a good segue into my next question for you, which is how did you find your way to climate science? Yeah, so I would describe myself, um, this is perhaps a hair splitting a little bit, but I'm, I'm a climate social scientist at this stage in my career. I began as a, as a natural scientist. I started out as an environmental scientist and got a couple of years into my undergraduate degree. And I really, really enjoyed ecology and biology and chemistry and, and the sort of natural science side of the equation. But I was wondering where the people were in all of those uh, classes that I was taking, all that learning I was doing. And so by the time I finished and then entered my PhD, it was so important to me to weave together those two sides of the coin. I just couldn't think about 
nature in the absence of humans and humans in the absence of nature. They're so um, woven together for me. At the time, this is many, several years ago now, um, around 2004, 2005, and uh, I was finishing my undergrad and wanting to go into grad school. And uh, I was sort of thrust right into the center of things just by sheer luck. I ended up um, pursuing a graduate degree under the mentorship of a professor named John Robinson at the University of British Columbia, who was at the time a lead author with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and he needed help with his work. And so I was a graduate student who was eager to learn and hopped on board. And I've been involved with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in one way or another ever since. Well, and, you know, for those of us who, you know, understand the IPCC, but maybe struggle with, you know, the dense findings, um, can you talk about, I guess, what are the most, from your perspective, the most important takeaways for those of us who are concerned about climate change? Yeah, just interested in your perspective there. Yeah, sure. There's a lot. It's it's certainly uh, deep waters to wade into, I guess, these assessment cycles. I mean, the first thing I would say is actually not about the substance of the reports, but the process. I mean, it sounds a little wonky and, and uh, obscure, but there is almost no scientific collaboration on earth like the intergovernmental panel on climate change it's kind of kind of remarkable that these that you know um, countries around the world nominate scientists to get together on a volunteer basis um, they're of course employed elsewhere so this you know they're they're paid in one way or another but their work for the ipcc is voluntary and then over the course of three years or so this group of scientists um, reads and evaluates thousands and thousands and thousands of scientific articles. So our goal is to assess and synthesize, you know, the state of the art, the state of the science on climate change um, to the very best of our ability. And that is social science, that's engineering, natural, natural science, all disciplines. Um, and then try and get a grasp on what scientists are telling us um, and ultimately distill it down to, to, you know, 40 pages or 60 pages for a policymaker to actually consume and make decisions on the basis of. So it's the scientific input to global on down to local decision-making processes. Um, and so it plays a pretty important role. There's lots of really valid criticisms we could get into, but the process itself is pretty unusual. Um, so this last assessment cycle, uh, the sixth assessment report, I was a lead author with Working Group 3, which is the one that focuses on uh, greenhouse gas reductions and carbon sinks, so on the kind of what we would call the mitigation side. Um, as opposed to the adaptation side, that's working group two, which focuses on protecting communities and what the impacts of climate change are. So uh, a couple of the key takeaways for me. So the first one is the not so optimistic, <laughs> but really important part of kind of truth telling, you know, when it comes to the, the climate, um, climate crisis. So the first major takeaway is that we are not currently on track to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial average. So we're, we're not on track just yet. And as it turns out, emissions over the last 10 years were the highest in human history. That's not good news. That's not great. No. Um, however, <laughs> really important to simultaneously bear in mind, that can be true and also true is the fact that this assessment shows that we now have evidence in about 18 to 20 countries of sustained real greenhouse gas reductions that would be consistent with this world we want to be in, which is, you know, limiting warming to two degrees or 1.5. So that means we have a roadmap. We have a, a significant and growing number of countries that have actually done the work required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we can look to their policies, to their technologies, to what they've done over the last 10 years to learn what we should do. That's fantastic. I think it is too. Yeah, obviously a key point in sort of our, our journey and, and response on climate change, but in that, you know, in no way trying to, to diminish the seriousness of what's going on. But it's, I think at the end of the day, especially for me as like an engineer, it's like if you can see examples of where Absolutely. it's being done in the way that you need it to be done to, to get to where we need to, that's certainly promising. Yeah, you're right. We need, we, especially in lower income countries and smaller communities, uh, reinventing the wheel just isn't an option. There, there, need, there needs to be um, solutions that we know already work. 
um, so that we can implement them faster and at scale in, in other places. So that's really exciting. This report also shows that um, that the cost of really important renewable energy technologies is plummeting in ways we could never have anticipated. Even the greatest optimist wouldn't have expected solar and wind and batteries, the cost of those to, to plummet by you know up to 85% or so. Um, and another really important finding, you know, I really grapple personally, and I know that a lot of folks who are concerned about climate change do as well. I, I struggle with the um, with sorting out who's responsible. Is it me as an individual? Because that's what I've been told for a long time is that it's me and my behavior that's the problem. And that's not right. totally incorrect. But, you know, it puts the the onus on me as an individual and you as an individual to, to change your personal behavior to you know, get us off this kind of collision course with an unstable and unsafe climate? Or is it a collective responsibility? Is it Should it be government? Should it be policy, regulation, these collective decisions that get us there? And this report kind of ties this nice loop between those two in my mind that I think is really important. So on the one hand, the report says that behavior change, so demand side, the demand side of you know, how much energy we require and the behaviors that, that demand that energy can get us 40 to 70% of the reductions that we need. So on the surface, I'd read that and think, oh, well, okay, this is an individual behavior change problem. But no, this assessment goes on to say that it's a combination of improved infrastructure, of technologies, of policies that would actually make it easier for you and I to change our behavior in a way that would deliver those 40 to 70% reduction. So it's a, it's a cycle, it's a loop between individual behaviors and the supports we need that are often the result of those collective decisions, policies, laws, regulations, and planning. In other words, as an individual, I might be able to change certain elements of my behavior, but there may be things that are out of my control or, you know, having the right policy mechanisms in place really incent me to change my behavior in a way that, that I might not otherwise. So hundred percent. Yeah. And you, I mean, you just cannot ask, you know, a single parent of three children who has to commute, you know, 45 minutes or an hour and a half to their job because that's where they can afford a home for their children to hop onto public transit that takes three and a half hours if, if the alternatives aren't available. Well, let's get to sort of the, the community and local level. And what would you describe as sort of a local or community level action when it comes to, to climate change? Sure. Yeah. So the most important, I mean, I realize this is kind of an obvious answer, but the most important um, part of this question for starters is that there is responsibility and jurisdiction over greenhouse gas emissions at multiple levels of government. So we have these international agreements. Um, there is no global government that can force countries to do things. We come to collective agreements internationally, like the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. And then our decision makers have to come home to their home countries and make domestic law and policy to meet what they've promised globally. So the national level governments, federal governments in our case and your case, are a crucial sort of scale of action. And then at the provincial and state level, there are jurisdiction over some sources of emissions and, and um, control over impacts of climate change. But then we go even deeper down to the municipal scale, to the city scale. Um, and the municipal, provincial, and state, and federal levels of government, in my view, need to be pushing in the same direction. They need to be, I, I realize this is sort of a mythical beast or the ideal uh, situation, but if we are all pulling in the same direction and taking action on those sources of emissions that we have control over at each level, you know, we'll make much, much faster progress. But within a city, within a municipality, we have communities within it. We have neighborhoods. We have um, districts. Um, and there's a lot going on in those very place-based communities. So that's where you really know people, you know, that's where you have relationships and trust. And I don't think communities necessarily like directly overlap with municipal boundaries. Of course, they cross sure. over municipal boundaries, but it's, it's where people have this attachment in my mind to a place, uh, which is really important when we're talking about nature and, and infrastructure and all of the things you sort of interact with physically on a daily basis. So, you know, in thinking about the the different sort of jurisdictional levels and, you know, these international agreements, where do you see, you know, these more local community level actions kind of fitting in? 
That's a great question. Um, I, I think they play different roles depending on the initiative. So in some cases, the local, municipal, city scale is where the problem has to be solved, like when it comes to transportation. So, um, and that I'm not talking now between sort of um, interurban or like regional transportation, but your your own city's supply of trains, buses, um, safe active transport infrastructure and that kind of thing. That is where um, there's enormous carbon reduction potential. Uh, electric vehicles are a, potentially a really important step in the right direction. However, it does they don't do a couple of things. They allow cities to still sprawl. Of course, they are fairly energy and material intensive in the production of them, unlike um, in terms of number of people transported, a public transport system or bicycles or walking infrastructure, that kind of thing. And they're also not, you know, financially accessible to all, to, to everybody. So I think they're one at the community scale, at the city scale, that's one really important transition that's happening, but there are other aspects to the transportation picture that we need to think about. So at, to, in answer to your question at the community scale, yes, um, there are climate change solutions where this is exactly the appropriate scale that they should be put into place. In other cases, they are more about a culture shift that I think spreads in unexpected ways. The solution itself might not scale, but the values do. So a good example is say community gardens. You know, it seems like such a kind of small, modest, you know, way to go. <laughs> the fact that community members are getting together and using say underutilized land in a way that enhances their food security and their access to nutritious food and perhaps provides food to families in need, reclaims skills that might've been forgotten, food preservation and you know permaculture or whatever. Um, those are all skills that might be very unique to that space. And we don't want that community garden to scale to be a thousand hectares. That's not what a community garden is. We want it to be small and nested in this community, but the values and the knowledge, the reciprocity and the skills can spread. So I think that's a, you know, that's a powerful role that community level initiatives can play. So I liked your example of the, of the community garden. Are there, are there other examples in sort of that local context that you've seen that are, that are notable or your favorites, let's say? My favorite. So oh, it's picking, picking a favorite <laughs> child, right? <laughs> We're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's one example that's sort of linked to a community garden here in my own region. There, we have a nonprofit called Sustainable Waterloo Region. And traditionally, they've worked a lot with small businesses, you know, helping them to measure their greenhouse gases and reduce them. But lately, they've been moving into sort of new territory, which is encouraging schools and private landowners to, to offer up very small underutilized parcels of land to plant microforests. So these are intended to be um, biodiverse spaces of land uh, where they could produce food. They could be fruit bearing trees or others, but often they're not. Um, they create shade, they break the wind, they sink carbon, they give school students uh, you know, an opportunity to learn about, to learn about forestry and trees and gardens and this kind of thing. Um, so there are all of these co-benefits associated with, with what seems like a very humble, and it is a very humble, very small step in tiny parcels of land. But those little parcels of land can be woven throughout dense urban spaces and create enormous benefits. So I love the idea of microforests. And that kind of falls into the bucket of nature-based solutions, which I think hold a ton of promise when it comes to both protecting communities from the impacts of climate change, like flooding and heat, and also sinking carbon. So reducing you know, the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff. There are people coming up with maker spaces and tool libraries, and of course, bike shares and um, all sorts of things in communities all around the world that give me a lot of hope. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely a fan of microforests as well. Yeah, I mean, as you point out, it you know, potentially feels small, but if you see that spreading across, you know, communities everywhere, that could have a, you know, real tangible benefit. And, and obviously it's nice too, to see, as you point out, the co-benefits. So it's like, there's things to be excited about with these solutions beyond just, let's say their climate benefits. There are other, you know, benefits that they're bringing to the communities at the same time. There are. And I think we need to do a better job of actively seeking those co-benefits. You know, we don't want them to just be happy accidents. Like, a co-benefit of a community garden or a microforest might be enhanced food security for marginalized or low-income people. Well, 
that won't happen unless you actively put that on your list of things you want this community forest or micro forest or community garden rather to deliver. So let's think about what those co-benefits are, who needs to be involved and engaged and ensure that we check many, many boxes when we're doing these, these things uh, with climate in mind. So I'm thinking, you know, as we're talking about these, these community level projects, how do we kind of you know, decipher between projects that are maybe well intended, but don't necessarily have much of a climate impact versus those that do. I mean, clearly we're talking about things that, that have not only climate impact, but co-benefits, but, you know, how do we kind of assess that out so that we're investing our energy in, in the right things or, or things that produce the best kind of return on investment, if you will? So I might have a slightly different answer to that than most folks, because I tend to think, <laughs> I I think, in my heart, I'm a systems thinker, which means that I that um, I like to think about the connections between things and how surprises can kind of emerge in ways that we might not have expected. And also how important it is that what we're trying to do on climate is not is not, not small. We're not trying to just improve our efficiency by 40% or 50% or reduce emissions by 10%. The scale of change that we are that we know is necessary to constrain warming to less than 2 degrees, you know, getting to net zero by 2050 is transformative. It's a big big deal and it may mean that our lives don't look exactly the same they are now, except, you know, when we flick the switch or we get into our vehicle, it's powered by renewables. There may be deeper changes afoot. So on the one hand, I would say, yes, you have to take a very clear eyed look at how many dollars are you spending? Where could those dollars best be spent? And how many tons of carbon are coming out of the atmosphere or not going into it in the first place? I completely appreciate that that when, when we have only climate in mind, Those are some of the most important metrics. However, for the deeper transformative shifts that might get us to a net zero world, I think it's equally important to cultivate these projects that build trust, that improve our physical health, that um, enhance biodiversity, you know, that make our communities more cohesive, more livable, more beautiful. Um, Those might not have the the very best near-term return on investment in terms of GHGs, but might plant the seeds of the deeper transformation. Oh, well, that makes sense. I, I know I can get caught up in the numbers too much. Yes, we need these significant near-term emission reductions, but we also yeah. have this greater transformation and things like, you know, we have climate change, but we also have big biodiversity loss in the world. And so there's, yeah, there's opportunity to deal with more than one issue at, at a time. Well, I guess in the spirit of trying to find ways um, for each of us to kind of get involved and in talking about community level actions, um, how would you suggest if somebody is interested in, let's say, being more locally focused, whether it's you're talking about folks that know each other, you know, through the local school or what have you, how would you suggest they go about getting involved and, and trying to support those community level efforts? Yeah. So first off, I would just say, um, I think it's helpful for me at least, to have an outlook on the world that sees these seeds that we're planting as a really important part of the process. We, I know we all want big, dramatic, fast, right now solutions, and those are necessary. But the only way that those come about is by first planting these little seeds that, um, that we can help to grow. So I would say, um, you know, approach the problem with humility and care in, in that regard, and that goes a long way. Um, the next step is to sort of reflect on where your skills are and where your community actually is. So, you know, who do you interact with? Um, do you, you know, uh, do you play a sport? Do you like to knit or paint or grow things or whatever your hobbies are? Um, the, those are the communities within which you already have trust and relationships and can start having these conversations. So, you know, not everybody needs to come up with a technical solution to climate change. You might be the right. person who's focusing on that community garden or on that bicycle share or um, or any one of dozens of sort of smaller scale community based solutions. So I think doing things that you love with communities um, that you are already embedded in uh, is a really powerful way to kind of enact hope. I think, you know, hope to me is, is a very active thing. It's It grows when we do things. But on the flip side, I would say those individual actions are super important in those communities that you already are, are close with. But connecting to 
the folks who make decisions on our behalf is crucially important. So for some of you that might be actually running for uh, elected office of some variety at various scales, that's a super important thing to do. For others, it might be writing that letter, making the phone call or showing up at, at a you know public participation session or a council session. Um, most elected officials that I have met do listen. And so um, making that connection between your individual values and beliefs and actions and those collective decisions like how your city is developed and what infrastructure investments are made is just so important. Well, Sarah, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to come talk to us about climate change, kind of what's going on at a macro level with the IPCC, and then what the importance of doing stuff at at a local level and getting involved in our communities. Um, Definitely appreciate you sharing your expertise. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. So, uh, gentlemen, what did you uh, think of the interview with Sarah? Yeah, look, uh, I, I, th- I think sometimes I get so focused on the um, you know, direct renewable energy side of things that you, you, you forget about all the other impacts that you can have locally on uh, reducing carbon emissions. And I think she brings up some really good points, especially around how we go and plan our communities um, and cities in general. Um, I... I I'm a big believer in uh, changes to the building code, but I mean, I think she brings up a greater point that we really need to totally rethink how we go and build um, our cities so that we don't end up with masses of urban sprawl that creates a level of dependence mm-hmm. upon energy intensive transport means. Totally. And, and the fact that, you know, you end up with people living in, you know, larger and larger square foot homes, which is, which is also equally energy intensive. I feel like in the U.S. sometimes you can see, especially like the the big cities that developed after, you know, the car kind of became king. I mean, if you kind of look at the difference between New York and Los Angeles, yeah, it's really evident. And it's so hard because I think Noam Chomsky said it once. Uh, it, you know, capitalism in the way that you were talking about this. I think one time Thomas about how they market stuff to you in cars and. They don't want you to not buy cars, you know, when you get when you see commercials, you know, you see commercials for a Ford or a Chevy, but you don't see a lot of commercials for a mass transit system. And so yeah, right. it's hard to get into that. And I, I know what she was talking about. We, we should maybe talk about that, too, about electric cars and, you know, you know, how it might not be the be all end all solution. For sure. We talk a lot about electric cars and the importance of converting to electric cars on this on this podcast. And and rightfully so. We if you're driving an internal combustion engine, you got to be thinking about your next car being electric. Yeah. But if, if we're looking to, I think what she was talking about in terms of a larger transformation, most of the trips you do already are within a couple miles of your house. And if you're able to make those more, you know, bike friendly or walkable, et cetera, then that's that much less time you're spending in a car. And sure, you know, at this point, if a car is a very necessary tool and, and if you're in rural areas, it's an absolute. But I think... The goal should be, you know, really trying to figure out how do we design our cities in a way that we reduce our total vehicle miles traveled. You know, we need to be in EVs, but we all know that even better than an EV is is an electric bike. And I, I think the whole coronavirus pandemic sort of brought that home in a, in a number of cities where they were shutting down roads to vehicles, uh, essentially because there were no vehicles, but there was now so much uh foot traffic and and bicycle traffic that it made people realize that how good things can be without you know so many automobiles driving around so yeah she she's definitely got a point whether they're internal combustion or electric vehicles the 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 amount of energy used compared to other means of transit are significantly more and they take up so much space so all of a sudden you've got to have parking spaces and multi-lane highways and all these things that could otherwise be allocated to green space or to allow us to densify the city so that we don't need so much uh, transit infrastructure anymore. Todd, did you uh, did you take notes so that we can get that injected into the, the peace plan? Yeah, I'll get that into the charter reform. Well, <laughs> you know, I think Portland already gets, people already complain about Portland putting in too many bike lanes, you know what I mean? But, you know, it's obviously, pre- you know, preferable to 
to running car traffic all over the place. Well, and and that was another thing I really liked about the conversation with Sarah was highlighting a lot of these, you know, what are called co-benefits because I think sometimes, you know, dealing with climate change can feel like a, a to-do list, all these things that we have to do. And, and there isn't always the time spent on the benefits that come along with it. You know, I know she talked about community gardens and while, you know, community gardens is them, themselves aren't a, aren't a big mitigation tool for climate change, you know, uh, they are absolutely an adaptation tool by providing cheaper food for low income folks, you know, community gardens bring people together too. Um, yeah. And so I, I think as we talk about different climate solutions that exist, especially those that we as individuals can be a part of, it is important to talk about those co-benefits because then you're reimagining what things could be, right? And and then you're being drawn toward them as opposed to feeling like you're being pushed. That's one of the biggest things I think I took away from what she was talking about. Community gardens was a big part of it, but kind of building those relationships and creating that momentum, you know, because a lot of the stuff that we talk about and, and what it's going to take and the kind of drastic change that can happen in people's lives, it's hard for them to wrap their head around it, you know, and it's hard to, it's hard to just all of a sudden throw it, you know, like throw it my dad, like, dad, you're going to be on an electric bike from here on out. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> but when you start with things that that sense of community and you kind of build that momentum and you build those relationships and you can kind of leverage that into those kind of lifestyle changes that people will be more apt to make. Absolutely. I mean, I really like to think about, you know, all of this is a climate journey, right? And and we're all at different points on our journey. Some people are just starting out, some are, are well along, but getting involved in these local level solutions, whether it's a community garden or a micro forest or, you know, helping with your local bike share program, they they all give us an opportunity to get engaged, to have a sense of community, and it helps you shift your mindset to, you know, well, where else can I be saving? Where else can we be making progress? And and it just builds on itself. I was thinking about those micro forests. My kid, you know, she was talking about having them at schools. My kid's been in school like five days now. I was thinking about just rolling in there Monday and being like, yeah, I'm going to need you to put a micro forest here. Uh, I'm going to need a creek. <laughs> I don't think they'd appreciate that very much, but you know, it is one of those things that you could aspire to do, right? You know, it, and it doesn't take much to start it, right? Like literally it's plant a tree. I mean, I've been planting a bunch of trees the last couple of weeks and you know, it's, but before you know it, it's, it's 10 years later, it's 20 years later. And all, all of a sudden you've got something that's now sequestered a bunch of carbon from the atmosphere is providing shade is providing clean air is helping clean the water. Like there are just so many benefits to it. And like it, it, it pulls the community together, right? Like people can get, get behind something like creating a micro forest, a community garden, whatever it might be. I agree. And, you know, I think that really, you know, brings us to what can we do? And, you know, you guessed it, get involved in your local community on something that has a, you know, a climate element to it and start by thinking about what's interesting to you, right? I mean, whether you're a gardener, whether you're somebody who, you know, is interested in trees, you're somebody interested in biking and let that guide your interest because it's going to be a lot easier to get excited about it if it's something that you're interested in. And just take the leap. Don't worry about, you know, what knowledge you have, what, you know, your experience in it. This, this isn't about, this isn't about a resume. This is about showing up. And, you know, as soon as you show up, you're starting to make a difference. Well, that's uh, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Come back next week when we'll be digging into the topic of oceans. I know there's a lot of ocean lovers out there and, you know, it's something we've been wanting to cover and haven't, but have a special guest to help us do that. So tune in next week. Climate Optimus is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co. And don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast. 